Welcome everyone, I'm Terry Austin and you're watching Lawn Climb Now. So the ACLU just called for the ouster of Kenosha's mayor, Kenosha's police chief, and the county sheriff, stating that they are defending white supremacists and demoralizing protesters for defending their First Amendment rights. All of this is in the wake of the protests surrounding the shooting of Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old man who was shot in the back seven times by police. Let's listen to what police chief Miskinnis had to say. Um, so over the last few days, Kenosha also experienced, unfortunately, looting, arson, Molotov cocktails, violence, persons injured. In addition, last night, in, in a situation that began peaceful and, and turned somewhat unruly, and the, the, the sheriff spoke about things that were thrown, hammers, bricks, <coughs> Violence toward law enforcement and toward the National Guard, who was assisting in controlling judgment or con controlling the uh, the scene here and protecting those who were rightfully speaking their mind. Persons who were out after the curfew became engaged in some type of disturbance, and and persons were shot. Everybody involved was out after the curfew. I'm, I'm not going to make a great deal of that, but the point is, the curfew is in place to protect. Had persons not been out involved in in violation of that, perhaps the situation that, that unfolded would not have happened. We have with us today Gigi Gonzalez. She's a Florida criminal defense attorney and also law and crimes judge Ashley Wilcott. Welcome both of you. So you just heard the chief of police and the first part of that presser actually was quite good, but we also heard him seemingly blame the protesters for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Judge Wilcott, what are your thoughts on that? So, uh, good afternoon, Terry. Let me just say that uh, if you look at it strictly from a legal perspective, right, and you start talking about First Amendment rights and the freedom of speech and is it protected or not, certainly protester speech is protected in this regard. However, you then have to look at the law that's being discussed, in this case the curfew, the government regulation, to see whether or not that law is narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling governmental interest. And he just laid out all the reasons that they believe that that curfew law is narrowly tailored and appropriate, the looting, arson, injuries, unruly, the violence towards law enforcement. So I think there's an argument to be made that there is a compelling government interest, and as a result, the curfew law is appropriate, doesn't violate free speech. But I would go one step further and say that doesn't mean to suggest that if someone is violating a curfew law that they necessarily, as a result, can expect to be shot. I don't think that makes good sense at all. Yes, and that's exactly what it sounded like he was trying to say, that if those protesters had not been violating the law, violating the curfew, they would not have gotten shot. And we know that Kyle Rittenhouse walked right by the police with his hands up, and the police failed to stop him. Gigi, does that seem as though to you that the rights of the individuals protesting and they were shot those rights were violated. And yet, Kyle Rittenhouse carried this weapon down the street. He had his hands up, and he absolutely walked right by the police. What are your thoughts about that? You know, I think that's the very essence of what these protests are about, right? Here you have uh, Jacob, who was shot at seven times point blank while his shirt was being held by the officer. Meanwhile, you have this armed vigilante who can walk right by officers, officers who are prepared for violence, who are expecting looters and rioters. Here they have an armed rioter walk right by them and they don't say anything. And to have the audacity to blame protesters for exercising their First Amendment rights for the actions of this armed vigilante, what's next? You're going to say, oh, you, you should have even been out because you knew that there were white supremacists walking around just begging to shoot protesters, so shoot, you should have never been there in the first place. Is that what's next? It's completely inappropriate, and the ACLU is absolutely correct to ask for these leaders to step down. Yes, I know. I think that 
asking is one thing, actually having it occur is going to be another thing. Let's listen to more of what the chief of police had to say. So the last night, a 17-year-old individual from Antioch, Illinois, was involved in the use of firearms to reserve, to excuse me, to uh, to resolve whatever conflict was in place. The result of it was two people are dead. This is not a police action. This is not the action, I believe, of those who set out to do protests. It is involved. It is the persons who were involved after the legal time involved in illegal activity that brought violence to this community. Judge Wilcott, that really sounds to me as though the police is trying to say it's everyone else's fault, but our fault. These two protesters were killed. Another one was injured, but it was the people who were out there, or it was the militia who came. But we had nothing, the police, to do with it. Does it not sound like he's trying to say that they are absolved from any responsibility altogether? Well, I do think, Terry, he was saying they were engaged in illegal activity, and as a result, these were the consequences. And what that fails to take into account, or what he at least failed to articulate, was, listen, that doesn't mean, again, that anyone needs to be shot or killed, but rather an appropriate use of force to deal with the circumstances. A lot of people engage in criminal activity, but guess what? There's not a result of death, and there doesn't need to be necessarily. And so that is what he leaves out of what he says, which is there are other means to restrain individuals who might be breaking the law. It should not result in this type of violence in this circumstance. Exactly. Gigi, does it bother you at all, though, that Kyle Rittenhouse walked away and that the whole reason behind these protests is the fact that we have Jacob Blake, who was shot in the back, and at least based on what we know, he wasn't at the time carrying a weapon. There's some argument as to whether or not he was reaching for a knife, but he was shot in the back seven times, and yet Rittenhouse is walking down the street with a loaded weapon. People are claiming that he just shot someone. He's holding his hands up, and yet the police pass him by. Does that seem to you there are many people who are saying it's not fair? Do you agree? Oh, I absolutely agree. And to answer your initial question, I'm very bothered by this. Uh, not just because this is the point of the protest, right, where Black people all over this country are being villainized based on the color of their skin, okay? Jacob couldn't walk to his car without being, uh, without the assumption present that he was dangerous, that he was armed, and he was going into his car where his kids were to reach for a gun or for a knife or whatever they were going to invent. It's completely inappropriate, especially when on the opposite side of this coin, you see someone walking right in front of you who is armed who is looking for trouble, who is violating the curfew, and yet you don't reach for his shirt and pull uh, seven bullets into him. No, 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 you let him reign free, and he's allowed to murder two people and shoot another. You know, and this is what, not to say that that's what um, Kyle would have deserved, but to treat everyone equally, okay? Treat everyone with, the de with human decency and with the assumption that they are not dangerous. Give Jacob the same opportunity to enjoy the uh, privilege that Kyle gets to. Well, that's right. And Kyle does enjoy the privilege right now of determining whether or not he's going to be extradited. We learned that today that was postponed and he'll be at a hearing sometime in September. Judge, let me ask you this question about Rittenhouse, whether or not he will be extradited. The hearing was postponed. There should be no question as to whether or not he'll be extradited. Do you agree? Well, I, I do think that um, I was just looking at some information, and I do think that he will be. I, I don't know what the legal argument against it is going to be. I haven't been privy to that or heard that information. So I have yet to hear what the legal arguments are that are going to be made. Yeah. Okay. So you know what? Let's take a quick break right now. When we come back, we'll break this down even further. I was standing there with a gun in my pocket. Knew you were going to shoot him? So, sorry? Knew you were going to shoot him? Absolutely. Okay. Tried not to, 
praying not to, but knowing down deep it was probably going to come to that. Did you know it would be that night? Did you know you would see him again? Yes, I knew that morning, oddly, when I left the hotel, I, I had some type of premonition that this was the last time I was going to leave my hotel room. That was Mark David Chapman. He's the man who shot and killed John Lennon in 1980. He was denied parole for the 11th time during a recent parole bond hearing. Chapman is serving 20 years to life, and we will have to wait another two years to see whether or not he's going to be released. We have with us today Gigi Gonzalez. Let me ask you this. Do you think he should ever be let out of jail? Tough question, right? I mean, we have to weigh the balances. A, he committed this awful, atrocious, cold-blooded murder of a world icon. Um, you know, but we also have to balance, you know, is this person rehabilitated? Is he ever going to reoffend? You know, he's already served how many years in prison? Is that enough to rehabilitate this person? Is that enough to uh, make sure that he's not a danger to society? And that's what's determined at these parole hearings. And the fact that he's been denied 11 times tells us that more likely than not, he is not rehabilitated and he has not proven to be safe for, and fit for society. So uh, probably, I, my answer would be probably not. Right. I think that one of the reasons he probably will never be released is the high profile of the crime, even though that should not be a consideration. Judge Wilcott, Chapman's legal team attempted to mount an insanity defense, but Chapman ultimately wanted to plead guilty. Do you think if they had been able to mount that sort of defense that he somehow had delusions, that they may have been successful at trial? You heard that interview with Larry King. He basically said he knew he was going to shoot him, but it did sound like he was a bit confused. Right. So if they had raised that defense, I can say this statistically, it's not frequently won when you argue that your client's delusional, didn't know what they were doing at the time the crime was committed, and that, or didn't realize the wrongdoing of it. And for that reason, it is a hard thing to achieve as a defense attorney. Now, it might have been successful. There's no way to know looking back. But I will say this, even if it had been successful, I would envision that he would be in some type of facility receiving care as a result of that. And if that were the case, given he has not been granted parole 11 different times and those hearings happen every two years, I would suspect that even if that defense had worked, he would still be in a facility getting treatment. I do not think that it means that he would be free on the streets living a life. You know, an individual is not entitled to parole, and the result is there have to be good reasons, and again, the rehabilitation has to be shown. Clearly, I would suggest, this to me suggests that there's something involved that indicates to the parole board he should not be entitled to it because he would be a risk of on the street. Right, exactly. You know, interestingly enough, Gigi, he had been working as a security guard. He never had any arrest. And all of a sudden, you know, he goes and he actually gets John Lennon's autograph. And shortly after that, he comes up and he shoots him. I mean, it sounds very delusional to me. He had no reason to do this. So do you think that he should be getting some sort of mental health you know, recovery at this point, because even though he's in jail, we should really be trying to make sure that all the prisoners are getting the sort of help that they need. Absolutely. The goal of prison it should be rehabilitation, right? We, uh, we should want to take people who have made mistakes or committed crimes and, you know, make sure that they are fit to never commit those types of acts again. You know, that is the goal of prison. That is the goal of the criminal justice system. Um, with that said, you know, you have to decide or we have to determine whether this person is genuinely mentally unsound or he's a cold-blooded killer. You know, did he become a security guard to earn the trust of people? Did he uh, get the autograph signed to earn the trust of John Lennon only to, you know, unleash his plan of murdering him? Did he want worldwide recognition of being this villainous person who took out a world icon like John Lennon? We really don't know his motives and whether they were fueled by mental illness or, uh, you know, just being a sick and depraved person. So, uh, you know, we definitely want to rehabilitate those people. But at some point, we have to ask ourselves, you know, if he's not rehabilitatable, 
Should he be released? No. Exactly. You know, we know last year that he told the parole board that he was, you know, feeling shame. I guess initially he did not feel shame. So let's see if he says the right things the next time he comes up for parole. Let's switch gears now to the Lesman Mitchell case. This is the case where we had a Native American who was just recently executed, despite the fact that the laws state that unless you have the consent from the leaders of that tribe and the consent was not given here, there should not be an execution. And yet, this individual was the first Native American executed since the new federal law was reimposed to reinstate the death penalty. So let's talk a little bit about the fact that uh, there was an appeal here. We're going to throw to a clip uh, in December 2009 where Mitchell actually appealed uh, the court's denial. I, I, I know the court's aware of this already, but I'm going to point out that this is the only federal capital prosecution of a Native American in the modern history of this country. Yes. Like the, the jury selection in this case resulted in a jury of 11 white people and only one Native American. But you, you appealed all those issues and, and lost on them. I, uh, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I sorry wish the too. government had not decided to, yes. to bring this capital case over the objections of the Navajo Nation. Yes, Your Honor. But it did, and all we're, all we're here today is about is the 60B uh, motion. So why does any of that uh, raise a significant uh, prospect of racial bias? As I recall, the district judge in this case asked each of the jurors to certify that they had decided the case without regard to racial bias. Yes, Your Honor, that's that's there's a standard in a portion of the Federal Death Penalty Act. But I, I just would remind the court that that certification is individual to each juror. So that what the juror is certifying is that juror herself wasn't motivated by racial bias. It doesn't speak to anyone else. But well, I guess I'm you... asking, other than the general background of the case, is there something that occurred during the case or during the juror deliberations that that you can hang your hat on to say? That's a significant showing. This, this is exactly the problem, Your Honor, is that we haven't had the ability to investigate this. And, and so because of the Supreme Court mandates of heightened reliability and anti-arbitrariness, we need to be able to investigate. I, I, I can't answer your question because I haven't been allowed to investigate. So Mitchell was convicted and he was executed. It was actually for the 2001 killing of Alice Slim and her granddaughter. And the jury found him guilty and they sentenced him, the judge did, to death. And you heard the arguments to that. Judge Mitchell, let me ask you this question. I thought it was a good argument. The argument that defense counsel was trying to make was that the jury, there were 11 Caucasians on the jury. He couldn't investigate to determine whether or not there was any sort of prejudice or bias. Do you think had he been able to get more information, he could have won? We saw that Scott Peterson's death sentence was just overturned. So maybe jury, you know, mishandling here could have won the argument here as well. Right. So I think it was an excellent argument. Let me just say I'm such such a trial nerd. I absolutely loved watching that clip of his argument before the court, the questions they were asking. It was insightful. He was making very good arguments. The reality is bias is the real issue. And it can be implicit bias. It can be something with individuals don't realize they're doing or how they're thinking. And so the opportunity to have investigated that, in my opinion, today and the times that are finally being spoken of and what really happens to individuals, I think that opportunity would have been provided. Should it have been then? I believe that it should have been. The reality is we have got to change our world and our justice system where there are any concerns about potential bias that they be investigated and looked into prior to a death sentence is executed. I think that's an excellent point, particularly because the death sentence is such a final sentence. It's not as though you can get out of jail many years later after multiple appeals. An execution is an execution. It's so final. Gigi, do you think that this decision was really in disrespect of the Navajo Nation's values and sovereignty? That was one of the things that the lawyers were trying to argue, that there is this law, and if it is disregarded, it's, it's disrespectful to the Navajo Nation and to the agreement that they have with the U.S. government. 
Absolutely. And quite frankly, the way the U.S. government snuck its way into being able to achieve this result is incredibly disrespectful. You know, they were able to come in under this vague notion where um, it's uh, carjacking isn't considered a serious crime under the treaty, and therefore they could seek the death penalty through the carjacking charge. You know, that's, yes, they're right, but is it respectful of the treaty? Is it respectful of this nation that we are supposed to be coexisting with? Absolutely not. And I would even further argue that are these jurors really uh, representative of his peers when he is a member of the Navajo Nation and this crime occurred on the Navajo Reservation? I would argue, no, it is not a representation of his peers. Yeah, I agree with that. And Judge Wilcott, here's the issue. We have not had many executions under the federal law. I think there have been eight, you know, since it's been uh, reinstated, or at least, you know, this year, I think it was. And so the point is, this is a very serious issue. And in the future, how do you think that jury should look at this? Is this something that they should even be considering, since not many people have actually been executed under the death penalty? I think that if it's going to be presented to the jury, it has to be done in a better way, in a very careful, cautious, deliberate way, in terms of talking about cultural sensitivities, implicit biases, things that can affect a jury's decision without the jury really realizing it, and certainly without the individual uh, members on a jury realizing it. So I think that, especially in regards to the Indian tribe, they cannot be disrespected. They have cultural beliefs that need to be respected, recognized, and it is unfathomable to me that those were expressed, articulated, and made very, very clear, but yet it didn't make a difference in the outcome. That's what we've got to prevent, and if a jury's going to make the decisions, we better have a way to ensure they have all the information before they're tasked with such a serious responsibility. I couldn't agree more. And actually, Mitchell was the fourth federal inmate who was executed this summer. So people are getting executed. Gigi, it's a very serious issue, as the judge just said. And do you think that for this particular case, with the Native American different tribes, that perhaps they should go back and maybe reaffirm the legislation so that we don't have these types of decisions that go against what the law actually is. Yeah, that's if the tribes are willing to even come to the table on that. You know, we, the U.S. government kind of stuck a knife in this treaty and said, we're going to figure out loopholes to undermine it. So, I mean, if we're discussing good faith relationships with the Navajo nations and other sovereign tribes, uh, are they going to say to themselves, yeah, we can trust the U.S. government, especially after years of disrespecting treaties and uh, their standing in this nation? I, they're probably not. You know, it would definitely in all of our best interests to work together. But I think that the government has made it very difficult for tribal nations to respect treaties in return. Listen, the bottom line is, if that is the agreement, that should be upheld. So somehow they're going to have to reinforce that. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we will take a look at what is going on in Fort Hood. Welcome back, everyone, to Law and Crime Report. What is happening in Fort Hood, Texas? There have been 23 deaths this year, eight deaths since March, including Sergeant Elder Fernandez, whose remains were found this week, and Private First Class Vanessa Gillian, whose remains were found in June. Both were allegedly the victims of sexual assault. A five-member civilian review board was finally put together to determine whether the culture is inclusive and free from sexual harassment. Judge Wilcott. Do you think the culture is inclusive and free of sexual harassment? I suppose we do need this panel, but what do you think they will find? 
I think they're going to find it's not inclusive because to me, there are too many things that I cannot chalk up to just coincidence, too many murders, too many uh, following the accusations that have been made. So clearly there's an issue. Now, what they have to do as a panel is pinpoint where it's broken down, why there's not inclusion, how to fix that, how to rectify that. But I clearly think that although the panel may be something they want to pursue, I think the conclusions are, are um, foregone conclusions in this case. Clearly, there's a problem. Yes, I agree. Gigi, clearly there's a problem. Judge Wilcott is absolutely positively correct. But do you think if this panel comes back with certain recommendations and they give those recommendations to the Army, what are the chances that the Army is actually going to impose those recommendations, knowing the history of all of these years where sexual assault and sexual harassment has been a big issue? I'm not saying that, you know, we've had murders throughout history, but certainly sexual harassment has been a big issue in the Army. What are your thoughts? You know, I think that it would behoove the military to take the recommendations of these independent review boards and apply them. Why? You are going to set the tone for um, changing the toxic culture of the military, where you see soldiers uh, turn up murdered or killed due to no foul play, even though they all have in common uh, sexual assault uh, issues, whether they reported it, whether they're sexually assaulted and trying to keep it calm what have you, you know, there is definitely a pattern of sexual harassment and action taken against victims who report sexual assault against their superiors or their peers or who have you. You know, and you see it right here. This played out exactly the same way as Vanessa Guillen with this Sergeant Fernandez. You know, it's very troubling. And if the military wants to attract new talent, if the military wants to change their reputation for being a culture of uh, covering up sexual assault, then they're going to have to take the findings of these independent review boards very seriously. I agree with that wholeheartedly. The fact that Vanessa was found June 30th and the person who was accused of killing her, David Robinson is his name, he was an army specialist, he shot himself. And Judge, do you think that that really shows, obviously, some consciousness of guilt as far as he's concerned. Well, I think, unfortunately, we're never going to know at this point, and it could go one or the other, one of two ways. It could be either he did it and he couldn't live with that because he recognized how horrible and wrong that was. On the other hand, it could be, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, I didn't do this, but he couldn't handle the thought of being accused, of being um, treated in the way that he would be treated as an accused, possibly even convicted, even if he didn't do it in his mind. I just think for one of those two reasons, he couldn't handle either of those consequences. Exactly. And we know that at the time, Cecilia Aguilar, that's Robinson's girlfriend. She actually has been charged with conspiracy to tamper with evidence there. Gigi, what are the chances that she will be ultimately convicted of those charges, in your opinion? Well, it depends on the evidence that the state has against her. But if they are able to prove that she was tampering with evidence, if she was acting at the direction of uh, Officer Robinson in, you know, this uh, removing evidence or hiding evidence or destructing, uh, destroying evidence, then she will definitely, the state will have uh, the ability to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she is responsible for tampering uh, with evidence and she'll be found guilty. Exactly. I think there is some evidence to that effect, but we'll see what happens. Listen, Gillian's family actually spoke to President Trump about passing a new law to allow service members to file claims to a third party agency versus filing claims within the Army. Let's take a look at that conversation. So what we could do collectively to get justice for Vanessa is we need reform. We need a bill. And you know, I drafted a bill that hashtag I'm Vanessa Guillen, Mark Wayne Mullen from Oklahoma. Yeah, good guy. Great guy. Love him. Um, he, well, he, it's right now in Ledge Council. But what it does is it says the way we have the EEOC, which is the Equal um, Employment Opportunity Commission, 
how if someone can report something, you go to the EEOC. We're looking for something that's going to allow our military, our, our soldiers, to have the same rights and protections. So that way, they're not going to their chain of command or internally. Right. What they're doing is they're going outside the command and reporting something. So suppose this, this kind of situation would have been in place if we had this kind of bill in place. Vanessa could have reported this, and they would have said, wait a second, this guy, Aaron Robinson, has a few of these problems. Like, look at this, this so guy's... Did she report anything at all? She reported it to her family and friends and some of the soldiers. She didn't do a formal report. Not to the, fort, not to the people. Right, not to the command, her bosses, who are also above her, who she's saying that were sexually harassing her. So we're going to look into it very powerfully, and we already have started, as you know. Right. And we'll get to the bottom of it, and uh, maybe things can come out that will help other people in a situation like Vanessa. Well, Trump said he's going to look into it very powerfully. I'm not sure what exactly that means, but hopefully he will look into it. And Judge, let me ask you this question. Do you think there is a good possibility that a law will be passed? It certainly makes sense to have a third party looking at these types of claims. But do you think that that law could be passed? Terry, I agree with you completely. It makes very good sense, given the history of the military, as well as how many claims not only have happened in the past that we know about as the public, but that continue to happen. And now you have all these other circumstances and you see people being killed. As a result, I think it makes such good sense. But I also think that the militaries are federal government, and I think that there's also just as good of a chance that they're going to say, let us have the chance opportunity to make changes internally to ensure that all of these types of claims are addressed appropriately. Don't take that away from us because we are able to do that for our own. That's, I, I just don't know which way. It could go either way to me. Exactly. And no, Gigi, there is a hashtag that's called hashtag I am Vanessa Gillian, and it's a it's the bill, actually, and that that is the name of the bill. Do you think the fact that there is such a public push behind this bill that that will make a difference? I think it does. You know, this Vanessa Guillen definitely um, took the attention of the entire nation. Her story is absolutely heartbreaking, and especially when you consider that this could have been prevented if she was in a culture in an environment that respected victims and listened to victims and advocated for victim and, and for true justice within the entire military. Um, you know, I think that it does have a strong public push, but I will say this, you know, what happens after there's an independent review board in place? You know, I think that this bill should even venture to go even stronger and go further and say, uh, you know, what's going to happen to the person who is responsible for victimizing these soldiers? Are they going to be removed? Are you going to be upheaving the victims? Like, What's going to happen as far as the victims to prevent uh, retribution from other officers, from her peers, from her uh, superiors, uh, or his superiors, or his peers? You know, I think that this bill should ride on the nationwide attention and go one step forward by ensuring the rights of victims. Yeah, one of the other things that the bill is asking for is more information going to the families. But, Judge, do you think that if the Army gave more information to the families, that might, in fact, hurt the people who are actually claiming this, the soldiers themselves, whether they've been sexually harassed or, you know, discriminated against? If the family is getting information, could that, in fact, come back and cause retaliation against the Army members themselves? Absolutely. Not only that, not only the fear of retribution by individuals, but also it could interfere with any investigations. As we know, law enforcement often doesn't reveal all of the information to family because it does, in, it really does, in many, many cases, interfere with the investigation. The Army would have those same concerns. So there's the balancing. You can't give a family so much that it can interfere or cause retribution, but certainly you want to be able to tell them whatever you can that won't do those two things. That makes a lot of sense. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be talking about more cases on Law and Crime Report. <laughs> The FBI SWAT team arrested Yasser Abdul Saeed in Justin, Texas without incident. This arrest 
as Chief Spivey has said, is a great day for law enforcement. The, the Dallas Violent Crime Task Force and the Irving Police have tirelessly, aggressively, and with, without pause followed every lead across the globe looking for this top 10 most wanted fugitive. I can't overstate how proud I am of the work of the investigators. This case was solved by good old-fashioned, aggressive, in initiative-based police work. That was Police Chief Spivey talking about the arrest of Yasser Abdel Saeed. You might remember this case back in January 2008. Saeed took his 18 and 17 year old daughters for a ride in his taxi, and hours later, the girls were found shot dead. One of the girls tried desperately to call for help. Family members stated that this was an honor killing. Saeed's son and brother were also arrested for harboring a fugitive. The girl's mother actually said that her girls will now rest in peace. This is a horrible case. Judge, let me ask you this. Why do you think it took 12 years to locate Saeed? You heard the police talking about job well done, pats on the back. But it did take 12 years, and he was hiding in plain sight. What are your thoughts about that? He was hiding in plain sight, but part of what we have to keep in mind is it's very clear that relatives were harboring him as a fugitive, and that means he had help. And when you have help and when you have financial resources, assuming the family probably had those to help him hide, it's a whole lot easier to hide in plain sight and for people to help protect you so that law enforcement cannot find you. I think that's why it took 12 years in this case because people didn't want him to be found and prevented him from being found. You know what is very interesting to me? Clearly, the son and brother were harboring him. Gigi, what do you think about the women in the family? The mother said the right thing, that now her girls can rest. But do you think the mother was also harboring or covering up or not speaking because of maybe their faith? You know, it's not, not a fair assumption, right? Um, and especially when you consider what the men in her family uh, are able to do to the women of her family, you know, it it's definitely puts her in a very difficult situation. However, I think that a mother's intuition uh, would override that cultural notion of, you know, being subservient to men. And I think that she would have done everything in her power to find Yasser if she actually knew about it. And I'm sure this mother is feeling extra betrayed knowing that uh, the son and her brother-in-law were the ones harboring the murderer of her children. Well, actually, you know, the fact that the mother was not of the same faith and she was waiting for him to be captured. And I don't know about the women in the rest of the family, but Clearly, this was a very difficult situation. Judge, you know, I agree 100 percent that when you have a whole family who's helping you to hide, that it will be difficult to find you. What types of evidence do you think ultimately led the police back to him? You know, follow the money. By that, I mean uh, people are inevitably going to slip up. So whether it's uh, withdrawing cash using a card that's in your name, whether it's uh, accidentally forgetting to cover your face at an ATM in a grocery store somewhere where a camera can capture you, all of those little things that you do on purpose to prevent being found, you just forget. And all of a sudden, your face is out there or someone sees you, you're on a camera, uh, an ID is found with your name being used. Some little thing like that can ensure that the FBI, the government, can find you and then figure out where you are. Right. I mean, no matter how you look at it, it's such a horrible, horrible killing, the fact that they were killed because they were dating and, you know, they weren't following the rules as they should have within the faith. So let's take a look now at more of that press conference and see what the authorities had to say. What drove those investigators from the Irving Police Department, from the FBI task force that includes other local police departments, to continue to look under every rock and chase every lead was to get justice for Amina and Sarah. Along with this operation, we've arrested two relatives of Saeed. They're going to be charged with harboring. 
in the Northern District of Texas. We are still seeking information from the public of others who may have provided aid and comfort to Saeed over the last 12 years. Gigi, what type of defenses are we going to hear in this case, at least as far as the son and the brother were concerned, that they were harboring him? What can they possibly say if, in fact, they were protecting this individual who was on the FBI's most wanted list? Um, what's a defense here, that they didn't know that he was a fugitive? That's going to be a pretty hard sell. Um, they're going to have to prove that, you know, they do not get any notices, that they don't walk into, uh, you know, uh, convenience stores that have these types of wanted posters on. Um, they're, you know, that would be their best defense is that they didn't know he was a fugitive. Um, you know, they can't argue that they weren't sure that he committed a crime, right? Because that's not what harboring a fugitive entails, right? You have to be harboring, so you have to be knowingly harboring someone that is evading the law. So they have to, the defense is, is that they were not knowingly harboring someone that was evading the law. And they have to prove that they didn't know that this person was considered a suspect in the killings of his daughters. Right, that's exactly right. And Judge, let me ask you this, as far as the defense of Abdel Said himself is concerned, what is he going to say, particularly if they have, and I don't know that they have this evidence, but if they have evidence of the actual gun and what he did and as far as the ballistics is concerned, if they have all that and they've maintained any of that, what would his defense be? Well, you know, you have to wonder if there might be a possible insanity defense raised for the reason that that at the moment the crime was committed, and if it was done as an honor killing, is he going to take the position, I was out of my mind, I didn't know what I was doing, I was so angry because the girls were doing ABC in violation of our culture, and I flipped out at that moment and killed them not realizing what I was doing. That's the only possible defense I think they might come up with, other than he didn't do it, right? Exactly. Other that he didn't do it. And he would absolutely, or the defense attorneys would absolutely have to figure out who else might have done it. Gigi, do you know or do you think that this type of killing might be more prevalent than we know about the fact that young girls might be getting shot or killed by their own family members because of this religious belief that they're supposed to not date or they're supposed to wear clothing to cover up themselves? Do you think this is something that we might be missing in society today? Well, you know, we have to consider which society this is missing from, right? These types of practices and this type of cultural identity is more prevalent abroad. You know, when you have immigrants and kid, children of immigrants who come to America, you do as the Americans do. You know, I, I'm a second generation Cuban American and I'm as American as apple pie. I went to the beach, I ate pizza, I, did, I dated the whole nine yards. And that would, if my grandparents saw it, oh my goodness, who knows what would have, what they would have said, you know? So I don't, I think we have to consider which society this is taking place in. And considering that this is happening in the Northeast of the United States of America, it's completely inappropriate to even imply that the culture pressures that this man was facing led him to commit these killings. Right. Well, I do think the police are going to be pushing that agenda to say that this is the intent, the motive, the reason behind the killing. Judge, let me ask you this question about what actually happened that day. One of the daughters actually tried to make a phone call to save herself. Do you think that type of evidence is going to be used at the trial, ultimately, of, you know, Yasser Abdel Said? Well, I think the prosecution is going to want to because it helps put a face on the victim and remind you she was vulnerable, she was scared. The other thing it does is give a timeline to show that it wasn't something he did in the heat of the moment without any thought, but rather he did it in such a way she had time to make a call like that. And I must say, when I'm on the bench and hear juvenile cases, regrettably, there are things that families do that may be part of their culture or culturally a reaction because of something the kids here have done. And I'm not suggesting it's always murder, but I am saying that those issues do continue to come up in our society.
I agree with you. And I think that from a prosecutorial standpoint, they are going to have to look at that because they will have to explain how a father could actually shoot and kill his two daughters. And unless there's some real reason behind it, I think that's what they're going to try to say. Gigi, Judge Wilcott, thank you so much for coming on today and being such incredible host and guest, and I appreciate it. And, you know, have a great weekend, everybody, and join us on Monday.